Hello, lovely folks of YouTube, Ren here. So I want to talk about a plant that has been in cultivation for a very, very, very long time. There is a huge amount of information and folklore on this plant. I'm really just going to kind of touch the surface and even then it's going to be one of my longer videos. I want to talk about apples. Uh, apples, the genus is uh, Malus domestica. Um, it is one of the most widely cultivated fruits worldwide. Uh, the Malus domestica is actually descended from the Malus siversii, uh, which is native to Central Asia, particularly Kazakhstan. Um, it has spread throughout Asia and Europe since antiquity. Uh, we have records of apples being cultivated in prehistory um, and eventually was brought to America with the European settlers. Now, due to the very complicated nature of apple genetics, the plants that we grow from seed do not have the same characteristics as their parents. Uh, they get sort of like this genetically lottery system in them that's really fascinating. Um, so most of the trees that we grow for domestic, you know, commercial use are actually grafted cuttings. They take a branch from a previous tree and then graft it onto a new rootstock to create a new tree. Um, that means that the type of rootstock that the cutting is grafted onto actually does have an impact on how it grows, which is why you have like um, dwarf apple trees, um, you know, are actually grown onto a, a dwarfing rootstock basically. So that uh, that rootstock not only can impart the characteristics of height of the tree, um, but also help to give it some disease resistance, give it a soil preference, things of that nature. Uh, now we do sometimes grow apples from seed. Uh, those apples are called pippins. And in fact, some of the cultivars that we grow now commercially originally came from pippin and they usually have pippin in their names. Um, an example I can think of off the top of my head is the Cox's orange pippin, which is a really popular tree grown in uh, like the Southern hemisphere. Uh, that was, it says pippin in the name. It was actually originally grown from seed. They hit that genetic lottery just right and um, managed to get a cultivar that actually could be used commercially from growing that seed and have since then cultivated it by taking the cuttings and grafting it onto rootstock. Uh, I actually have another tree that was originally a pippin there. Um, it's one of my three apple trees is the Albemarle pippin, which was originally grown from seed um, and cultivated by um, Thomas Jefferson in Monticello. So, and then my third and largest apple tree is actually a genuine pippin. It was grown from seed by my oldest uh, when they were in kindergarten. Um, I was like, sure, go ahead, plant the apple seed. Well, and I'm not expecting it to actually grow, and it grew, and then I was obligated to plant the tree. So, so now I actually have to um, have a real pippin in my yard. So, uh, apples are in the rosaceae family. Um, as you can guess by the name, roses are the type for that family. Um, but there are other plants that we are familiar with in that rosaceae family would be uh, quinces, pears, hawthorn, um, and then various prunus species being cherries, plums, things of that nature. Now an apple tree is not self-fertile. You need to have two different cultivars of apple in order to, for either of those apples to actually set fruit. They have to be cross-pollinated. Um, the other thing, of course, is that if you <laughs> different cultivars of apples will have different bloom times. So when you choose an apple for cross-pollination, you have to be sure that it blooms at about the same time as the apple that you want to set fruit, otherwise you're gonna be out of luck. So um, most commercial growers will grow a long row of one particular apple, and then at either end of the row, they will plant a crab apple, um, which is the um, Malus sylvestris, which is actually a Native American apple. Um, the reason being is that that Malus sylvestris will cross-pollinate with the uh, Malus domestica and give you fertile fruit. Um, my pippin is probably a hybrid between um, Golden Delicious, which was where we originally got the apple from, and a crab apple, which is why it makes these little lady-sized apples about this big. So. This pollination, of course, is not wind pollination. It does require bees. Uh, most commercial growers will actually bring in bees on a rotation in order to um, fertilize their crops. 
um, but you know that's really only necessary if you have a giant field of apples. Uh, for the domestic home grower like myself, I have found that the native bumblebees work just fine for pollinating my trees. Now another peculiarity of the different cultivars of apples is recorded in their number of chill hours, okay? The chill hours are basically the amount of time that the tree has to spend in, do in winter dormancy in order to be able to bloom and set fruit the next year. Um, some cultivars have a very low chill hour requirement. Uh, this cultivar behind me is notorious for how little chill hours it needs. Um, this cultivar is called the Arkansas Black. As you can guess from the name, it originated and was mostly grown in Arkansas, so it likes hot, uh, long, steamy summers. Um, and of course, as you can see here, the color of the fruit when it's ripe is a red that looks so deep that sometimes those anthocyanins almost get black on the skin. So, um, But other apples require different chill hours. There are some apples that grow in the more northern climates that may not actually grow and set fruit here in the south where I live simply because we can't provide it with the number, with the length of winter dormancy that it needs to set fruit. So if you are going to plant an apple tree, that's another thing you need to take into account. Um, apples can grow in a wide variety of ranges. However, they do not like tropical weather. Um, Arkansas is about as far south as you can grow and you have to have a special apple to grow there as evidenced by this Arkansas black. Um, but generally the more northern climates or higher elevations tend to do better for apples. Um, regardless of the type of apple you have, they're all going to require as much sun as possible. Full sun at least eight hours a day, more is better. Um, one of the things that we actually do with our apples, in fact, is um, one of the reasons we prune apples so heavily is to open up that tree and ensure that all of the branches that are actually going to be bearing fruit are getting sunlight because they need that sunlight in order to bear the fruit. So the pruning is actually to remove all the non-fruiting branches, as well as any branches that might be problematic or diseased, um, things of that nature. Um, we also tend to open up our trees a lot because they are very, very, very susceptible to diseases. Um, in particular here on the East Coast where I live, it is actually impossible to grow organic apples here. Um, I mean, you can grow them, obviously. I'm growing apples, but you can't grow them for commercial use because they tend to get just kind of wonky and spotty looking and they don't, they're, they're edible, they're fine, but they don't look good and therefore they won't sell them in the grocery stores. So all of the organic apples that you're seeing are actually grown on the west coast of the United States here in the U.S. Um, because the fungal diseases that affect apples and make them look wonky are not endemic there. They don't grow there and therefore they don't need to use all these harsh chemicals to antifungal chemicals to spray their apples in order to grow them organically. But here on the east coast, if you want to have a nice looking apple that you can actually sell, you pretty much have to sell them. So when you go apple picking, you're not getting organic apples here in the, U in the east coast. Sorry, it's just, it is what it is, so. Um, it does take about eight years for a full-size tree to bear a full crop of fruit. Um, if you have a dwarf fruit stock, it can be less time than that, but usually about five years. This tree behind me here is about three years old, and although it has a decent amount of fruit on it, I really shouldn't have let it fruit because it does slow down the development of the tree, but, you know, I'm not doing this for commercial purposes. I'm doing it for my own personal use and I wanted to have a few apples. So I let it grow a few apples this year. Um, this is actually the first year it's set fruit for me. So again, really exciting. It's hard to take it away, you know, when it's like, oh, the, the tree gave me apples. So, um, but ideally I should have pulled off all those little fruit buds and, uh, and just let it dedicate its growth, dedicate its energy into growth for at least another year or two before I started harvesting fruit under ideal circumstances. Um, when you harvest apples really depends on the cultivar. Um, this one here, this Arkansas Black, is probably pretty close to ready. I'm filming this now so that I can harvest the apples after this. Um, these apples are actually designed for long storage, so they tend to be picked when they're kind of hard and green and sour, um, and they kind of mellow out and sweeten at, over time as they're stored. Um, other apples are better for fresh eating and, of course, you know, pie making, you know, making jams, etc., etc., apple butters, you know, what the cultivar is good for is really dependent on the 
the cultivar, you know. Some, in fact, are not really used for fresh eating at all, but make excellent cider apples. Um, like my little tree over here, the Pippin, really isn't good for fresh eating. The apples are really small, um, and they're a little on the sour side, but that malic acid is really good when you make something like a cider, so. Um, one thing you do, of course, want to remember if you are going to store your apples for long-term storage is that um, they need to be absolutely perfect and blemish-free. Um, apples are generally good for months and months in long-term storage, but only if they're absolutely perfect. As soon as one apple is bruised, then it's going to set off this chemical chain reaction that's going to ruin the entire bushel of apples surrounding it. And that's where our phrase, one bad apple ruins the bushel, comes from. Uh, which means that if you have one bad apple in that group, all the other group is suspect. So. so there is a huge, huge body of myth and folklore surrounding this tree, which again ties into the fact that this tree has been in partnership with humanity for such a long time. Um, so a lot of people think of this tree as being the fruit of the tree of knowledge from the Christian mythos. Um, which, of course, there's some argument for or against, you know, but the fact that it's kind of sealed into our ideology, into our brains in that way, is very telling. Um, there's a lot of myths that associates this, um, this tree, particularly its fruit, with immortality. Uh, for example, the Isle of Avalon in um, Arthurian myth, you know, the place where um, Arthur's spirit is said to rest uh, eternally and wait to be reborn. Uh, Avalon means apples. So the Isle of Avalon is literally the Isle of Apples. Um, there's also the story of Idun in the Norse myth, uh, who possessed a box of golden apples that granted immortality to the gods. Um, and part of one of the myths uh, involves Loki stealing them. Um, and then the gods started to grow old and uh, Loki had to be persuaded to return the apples in order to ensure that the gods can continue to live. Um, there's a lot of other myth involving apples. There's the golden apples that were given to Hera by Gaia. Um, and then of course Hera set them to be guarded by the Hesperides at the western end of the world. Um, and then Heracles or Hercules in the Roman myth was given the task of retrieving those apples as part of his uh, one of his 12 labors. It was the 11th labor. And this was the labor where he tricked Atlas into fetching the apples for him by basically offering to hold the world on his shoulders and give Atlas a break. And then, of course, when Atlas returned, uh, Heracles was like, okay, you can take the world back now. And Atlas goes, you know, I don't think I will. And then Heracles basically said, oh, man, you can't just leave me like this. Let me go get, get my affairs straight and, you know, just hang on to this while I do that and then I'll come back. And then, of course, he didn't because that's how he is. <laughs> cunning. Um, of course, there's also the story of Eris and the golden apple, um, which of course was inscribed with for the fairest. And uh, Eris threw that apple amongst the three goddesses and basically set off the events that eventually led to the Trojan War. Uh, apples are also considered to be a huge favorite of the fair folk. Um, an apple orchard is basically considered to be sort of a liminal place and a good place to spot those good neighbors. Um, generally, the last apples that were left on the tree were considered to be an offering to those spirits. Um, particularly, any apples that are still remaining on the tree after Samhain are basically off limits because they belong to those neighbors. Um, any of the tr apples that I can't reach, I generally leave for them. I don't take them off. Um, now, there's some folklore that says that any apple that remains on the tree until spring will foretell death. Um, so in those cultures, the apples that were left would basically be removed and dropped to the ground around in bulk. Um, now, other lore uh, that says that it's not actually just leaving the apples on the tree, it's when you have apples on the, on the boughs and also the tree blossoms at the same time, that that's the death um, symbolism. So, um, And then of course, finally, an apple orchard was considered to be the best place to spot a unicorn. Uh, orchards were also homes to uh, the Goggy or the Odd Goggy, which was a boogeyman that lived in the largest tree and was depicted as a giant caterpillar. and. Um, 
was generally a tale told to kids to scare them away from the apple orchards and stealing the apples in, in them because basically the doggy was said to climb down from the largest tree and eat any children who went into the orchards unattended. So, <laughs> fun, fun stuff. <clears throat> Apples are really, really widely used in love magic and love divinations. There's a lot of folklore that ties the apple in with the love magic. Um, for this reason, and amongst others, <clears throat> this plant was very widely considered to be an herb of Venus, um, especially the flowers of the plant. Um, sharing an apple with a loved one was said to bind the two people together. Um, Apples were also sometimes used in magic to compel love. Um, there's usually a thing where like, I don't want to go into too much detail, but basically it's putting some of your bodily fluids inside the apple and then giving it to someone to eat was said to compel their love. Um, there's a lot of love divination. Um, some people know of the, um, where you peel the apple, it, um, make a one long continuous peel, and then you throw that peel over your shoulder um, usually the left shoulder, um, and then the, the peel was, was said to fall in the shape of the letter, the first letter of your soon-to-be lover's name or something like that. Um, there's also a story of throwing the apple pips in the fire, where you name each pip for one of your potential lovers, and the ones that pop, the one that popped first was said to be the one that burned for you, and the ones that just kind of wilted away said, didn't have any love for you. Um, a similar thing with where you would take the apple pips and you would place them on your forehead and the last one to stick was said to be the one who, who's, who wanted to stick with you, basically. Um, there is, um, there's a very simple, uh, divination that's done, uh, with apples that Jarena Dunwich mentioned in one of her books, where basically, um, you have an apple, you ask the apple a yes or no question, and you then cut the half, cut the apple in half or if the top and bottom are the apple, you cut it this way so you can see the pentacle inside the apple, and you count the number of seeds inside. Um, if it's an odd number of seeds, then um, the answer is yes, and if it's an even number of seeds, then the answer is no. Um, and of course, revealing that five points of the pentacle is also one of the reasons why the apple is considered to be uh, very deeply uh, magical and religious for us in the, the Wiccan faith as well, because it basically has its own pentacle inherent inside of itself. Um, bobbing for apples was a really, really popular pastime, particularly at the time that we consider to be Samhain, um, or All Hallows Eve, or Halloween. Um, basically, if you could manage to grab one of the apples in your mouth, uh, it was considered to be a fortuitous omen, and you would have good luck for the rest of the year. Um, apples are also considered to be the food of the dead, and they were very widely used as offerings to the dead to kind of help to sustain them on their journey to the afterlife that's generally made around the time of Samhain. Um, there's a lot of folklore that ties in apples with fertility. Um, because of this fertility aspect, some people place the apple under Jupiter instead of Venus. Um, Wassailing at Yule is one of the really big examples of a fertility rite that's done regarding apples. Traditionally, wassailing would be where you would take the um, uh, the wassail, which was usually um, a concoction based on cider and beer and a lot of other things, and you would go out and you would toast the trees and you would spray the trees with wassail and you would sing to the trees in order to ensure a good crop of apples for the following year. Um, Seeing the sun shining through the branches of your apple trees at Yule or Christmas was said to be an omen of good luck for the rest of the year. Excuse me a moment, my notes are blowing. Um, so, um, and then of course also like there's a good argument that um, the apple themselves could have been seen as a symbol for the sun at Yule. Um, that a lot of the time, like in early English um, periods, they would not have had oranges to make pomanders out of, and it probably was apples that they used instead. Uh, Harold Roth in particular is a proponent of this argument, um, that if you didn't have an orange, like, you were going to use an apple, and that round red apple basically became your symbol for the sun and Yule. Um, and then of course, you know, finally, the wood itself of apples 
is considered to be one of the best choices to make wands out of. Uh, it has a very protective quality, it's very nurturing, it has a lot of fertility aspects associated with it. Um, and of course, you know, that magic of love as well, if that's uh, something that you wish to um, sort of bring into your life. Not necessarily love between one person and another, but just love in general, love for life, love of the gods. All of these things can be brought in with the apple tree. So, wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, and that, like I said, this is really just kind of touching the surface. There's so much more myth and story about the apple that I just, I'm dry and I just don't have the, the I don't have the spit to talk anymore, so, um, but yes, growing your own apples is not for everybody. Um, I have three apple trees and that's about all I can fit. It's taking up a big chunk of my yard just to dedicate to those three apple trees. Um, if you have the space for two, because you need at least two, uh, it's always a fun thing to have. Um, but if you don't have the space and you live in some place where apples do grow, um, I do feel like it's worthwhile to go to an apple orchard and just have the experience of picking your own apples and getting to eat an apple right off the tree because it is just a transcendent experience that is so different from the apples you buy in the grocery store. I mean, my eyes were really opened the first time I went apple picking and ate an apple right off the tree. Um, and that was what actually led me to eventually growing my own apples is so I could have that experience when I felt like it, when the season was right, of course, not just any time. So. Um, but yeah, even if, if you don't have that option, there's always the grocery store. Apples are very, very, very readily available at the grocery store. They're one of the most common fruits out there, at least here in the U.S. I would assume elsewhere as well. Um, and it's just, it's a, it's a great little apple that can, has its own very potent mythos to it. So anyway, that's all I have for you today. I hope this video finds you well, and I will see you again soon.